let's start off by looking at a simple Jeru program. Here I've created a Jeru called Monica and you can see that she's right here three blocks from the end and we want her to walk forwards until she reaches the water. One way we can accomplish this goal is by putting three con uh, consecutive hop statements here. Let's run this program and see if that works. Well that worked fine. We can reduce the size of the program slightly by putting the number 3 inside the brackets and let's run the program again. And we see this time Monica has hopped 3 all in one step and once again is positioned just before the water. While this is acceptable, the problem with such a program is that it's not quite flexible. For example, if, Jer if the Jeru Monica was to be born in a different position, let's say that I started her in the middle of the board here. Now I would have to change the parameter inside this parentheses in order to have Monica stop when she gets to the water. Right now she's going to stop woefully short. So it would be better if we could instill Monica with a little bit of intelligence to let her keep walking until she reaches the water. We can do just such a thing using a while loop. Let's have a look. Instead of putting a hop statement here, I'm going to use a while. And I'm going to tell Monica to keep walking as long as the area in front of her is clear. So I'm going to say while Monica is clear ahead, I'm going to have her hop. Let's try out this new program. You can see that as Monica is hopping, the next line of code that's executing is being highlighted. Now you can see that as Monica reached the water, this statement about the path being clear ahead of her was no longer true, and this while statement stopped executing, and this program completed as shown on the bottom. The advantage of such a program now is that no matter where I position Monica initially, you can see that as soon as she gets to the water, she's going to stop. By using a control structure such as a while loop, we can dramatically shrink the size of our code and at the same time make it more flexible, have it be working even when the Jeru is positioned at different points on the island. Now let's briefly discuss the parentheses that surround the while statement. Here is the opening curly bracket and here is the closing curly bracket. The statements that are inside these curly brackets are going to be the target of the while loop. We typically indent all these statements in here to make it easier for the reader to tell which statements belong to the while loop and which ones are outside the loop. One important rule is that there is only one statement that belongs in the while loop. These curly brackets are indeed optional. So if I was to get rid of these curly brackets here, if I was to restart this program and run it, you can see that the program is going to work exactly the same way, even without the curly brackets. Notice that the blank line after the while loop does not matter because the compiler ignores all the blank lines in the program. So therefore, the rule is if we have one statement that's the target of a while loop, these curly brackets are indeed optional. However, if we wanted to add more lines of code to be placed inside the while loop, for example here, or perhaps after this hop statement, then in order to indicate that multiple lines are part of the while loop, these parentheses would become mandatory. Now let's look at a different type of while loop. This time, instead of putting a Boolean operator inside, I'm going to replace this with the word true. Since true is always true, this loop will run forever, or at least it will try to. Let's see what happens in this case. Here we see that the loop continues to run. Unfortunately, Monica eventually ends up falling into the water. Since Jeruz can't swim, that's pretty much the end of our program. The while true is similar to the forever block we used when we were doing Scratch earlier in the year. Now we're going to augment this while loop structure so that once again we can avoid having Monica fall into the water. We're going to do that by introducing something called an if statement.
In this program, since we don't want Monica to drown, we have enhanced the while loop by putting an if statement inside that prevents Monica from hopping if the path ahead of her is not clear. In this case, if there is water ahead of her. Let's run this new program and see how well it works. We see that even after Monica reaches the water, the while true loop, true to its nature, continues to run forever. However, Monica does not hop any longer because the if statement is no longer true. Let's now make a further enhancement to this if statement, which will make Monica turn each time the water is ahead of her. We will do this by introducing an optional else clause and putting inside the else a turn. So each time Monica reaches the water, we're going to have her turn right. Now you see each time Monica reaches the water, instead of stopping, she simply turns and then the original hop statement starts to take over again until she reaches the water once again. The else statement, as you have probably guessed by now, is optional inside an if. Let's look a little closer at this if-else structure. Whenever we have an if-else statement, exactly one of the two blocks is going to execute. If the condition inside the if statement is true, then the first block will execute. If the condition inside the if statement is false, then the else clause will execute. Similar to the rules we had for parentheses with the while loop, if only one statement is the target of the if statement and one statement is the target of the else statement, then the brackets that you see here are not necessary. If, for example, in this case, I have a single statement here and a single statement after the else, I don't need any of these brackets. I can remove these brackets and rerun the program now and it will continue to work exactly the same way as before. The brackets are only a requirement if there are multiple lines targeted for the if clause or targeted for the else clause. In the final part of this tutorial, we're now going to demonstrate how we can make our own Giroux methods. We've already seen methods that have been defined by the program, for example this isClear method which takes an argument. We're only going to be making methods in Giroux that take no arguments, just to keep things simple. I'm going to take some of this code here and I'm going to do a control X and then I'm going to come over here to where it says Giroux methods. Inside the Giroux methods tab I'm going to define a new method called move. And in that method I'm going to place the code that I had before. Once again in the move method the move checks to see if the path ahead is clear and if it is uh, I'm going to have the Giroux hop. Otherwise it's going to turn right. One other change I'm going to make is I want the move method to work for any Giroux, not just for Monica. So I'm going to leave the name out here. Now we'll be able to call this move on any Giroux. Let's go back to the main method now. And inside here, let's call the move method on Monica. Now let's start the program all over again. You can see that we're doing exactly the same thing that we did before, but we were able to take a bunch of code that Monica was executing and make it generic and put it into the Giroux move method. What's the advantage of such approach? Well, one thing is that if we have more than one Giroux, for example, let me create a second. I can now call the same method on Monica and Bob one after another. Now let's run this program. You can see that Monica and Bob are now sharing the move method. Each one will be smart enough to turn when they reach the water. And here they go at full speed.